Hey everyone, welcome back for another deep dive. You know, yeah. we love digging into military theory here. And this one, what, let's just say, if you've ever had to think about strategy and defense out in the field, you're gonna find this one especially interesting. Absolutely. We're jumping into the mind of Carl von Clausewitz with On War. A classic. And trust me, this guy's insights are as sharp and relevant today as they were back in the 1800s. You know what always strikes me about Clausewitz? It's how he frames the whole idea of defensive warfare. We tend to think of it as like this reactive thing, you know, just holding the line, waiting for the enemy to make a move. Right. But Clausewitz, it digs deeper. He says, look, the goal isn't always about immediately going for the knockout punch. Sometimes it's about protecting what you've got, your territory, your forces, and picking your battles carefully. And that's where his ideas about strong points come into play, right? Yeah. Exactly. And he isn't talking about just any old defensive position. Clausewitz, he's talking about places that are practically untouchable. Think natural barriers like mountains and rivers combined with some seriously clever fortification. He goes into a bunch of historical examples to illustrate this point. You've got Pirna, Bunzelwitz, Kohlberg, Torres Vedras, Drissa, each one showing how geography and military engineering can work together to create a stronghold. It's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. But even with all that defensive power, Clausus doesn't sugarcoat things. He's very clear about the inherent challenges of strong points. Oh, absolutely. He's realistic about the potential downsides. Like, imagine trying to keep those supply lines open if you're completely boxed in. And then there's the whole issue of potentially getting surrounded. And let's not forget the strategic implications. If you've got a big chunk of your force stuck in one place, it limits your options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you lose a lot of flexibility. Exactly. He makes you think about that balance, the incredible defensive potential versus the potential costs and limitations. Which leads to a big question. Especially in our world today, with all the advancements in technology and tactics, do these fortified locations, these strong points, do they even matter anymore? That's the million dollar question, right? And honestly, it's something that modern military strategists are wrestling with all the time because yeah, warfare has changed a lot, but think about it. A strategically vital island a heavily fortified mountain pass, even a well-defended base in an urban environment. The tools might be different now, but that underlying principle, using geography and construction to create a stronghold, it's an idea that's hard to argue with. It's like that saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Exactly. Or in this case, those who don't learn from the past might just miss out on some really effective strategies. Right. Now, Kalsovitz, he doesn't just stop at strong points. He also digs into entrenched camps, particularly those near fortresses. And what's interesting is how he highlights the dual purpose they serve. So you can think of them as a buffer zone, an extra layer of defense for your fortress. But they can also be valuable training grounds for troops who haven't seen a lot of action. And this is where Klausowitz's emphasis on strategic thinking really shines through. He's very clear about the trade-off. Also. Well, on the one hand, an empty entrenched camp, it can actually make your fortress more vulnerable. But on the other hand, if you're constantly manning both, that's a huge drain on your resources, on your manpower. He's basically saying, look, entrenched camps, they can be game changers, but you better be darn sure you're using them strategically. He's really making us think about the bigger picture, isn't he? Absolutely. I mean, it's not just about building the strongest walls or digging the deepest trenches. It's about really understanding your resources, where to put them, and knowing that every decision has a cost, right? It's like he's constantly reminding us that there's no such thing as a perfect defense. Every advantage you create, well, there's always a potential flip side to that, almost like a, I don't know, a law of physics or something. Right. And speaking of strategic trade-offs, that brings us to another fascinating concept that Klausowitz explores. Flank positions. Oh, yes. This is where things get particularly interesting. Okay, so tell me more. Because Kosovitz, he comes right out and says that all effective defensive positions are, at their core, flank positions. It might sound a bit counterintuitive at first, mm. but stick with me. Klausowitz isn't saying that every defensive position literally has to be on the enemy's flank, you know, on their side. Right. Together. What he's arguing is that the ultimate goal of any strong defensive position, it's about influencing the enemy's movements. Right. You want to shape how they move, where they go, and how do you do that? You create a threat to their flank, their rear, something they have to react to. So you're essentially dictating the terms of the engagement, even when you're on the defensive. But I imagine that kind of positioning, it comes with its own set of risks, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Klausowitz, he throws in this almost like cautionary note 
about the inherent riskiness of flank positions. He makes it very clear that while they can be powerful, decisive even, if the enemy decides to call your bluff, if they attack head on, things can go south pretty quickly. And wasn't there an example he used, something about the Prussian army back in 1806? Yep, that's the one. Refresh my memory on that. So the Prussians, they're facing Napoleon, and trying to deter his advance, they take up what you might call a classic flank position relative to the French line of advance. Bold move. In theory, it was a good strategy. The French, they attack this well-prepared enemy or they have to make a risky maneuver around them. They're in a tight spot either way, right? Yeah, a true damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. Exactly. But here's the thing. Napoleon being Napoleon, he took the risk. He launched a direct attack. Didn't end well for the Prussians, did it? <laughs> Not quite the outcome they were hoping for. But it really makes you think, okay, so that was then. But fast forward to today. Lightning fast trip movements. We've got long range weapons, instant communication. Everything's happening at such a faster pace. So how does a military leader today, how do they even begin to wrap their heads around utilizing a flank position in this kind of environment? It's a whole different ballgame. That's yeah. undeniably more complex now. Right. You're absolutely right. Of course, Clausewitz, writing back then, he couldn't have foreseen the kind of technological leaps that we've had, how radically the battlefield would change over the centuries. But even then, he grasped the fundamental principles at play here, risk versus reward. He knew that a well-executed flank position, it can be decisive, sure, but it's always a gamble, always. So how do we take these almost timeless principles that Clausewitz lays out and apply them in a modern context? It's about recognizing that the core principles he emphasized, understanding the geography, carefully assessing risk, being able to adapt on the fly. These are principles that transcend any specific technology or era. The tools we use in warfare, yeah, those are constantly changing, evolving at an incredible pace, but the nature of conflict itself, offense versus defense, the importance of strategic thinking, these are timeless. And that's why Clausewitz's work continues to resonate with military minds even today. It really makes you realize that the study of warfare, it's about so much more than just the hardware, isn't it? It really is. It's about understanding the human element, the psychology of conflict, the decision-making processes. It's like Clausewitz is giving us this masterclass in strategic thinking. And the best part is, he doesn't try to give you all the answers, you know, like some kind of recipe book for warfare. He gives you the tools, the framework to analyze complex situations and make the best possible decisions with the information you have. So to wrap things up, we've covered strong points and trench camps, flank positions, all these ideas that Clausewitz laid out. And even though he was writing, what, almost two centuries ago now, it's amazing how relevant his insights still are for military leaders today. And you know what stands out to me most about Clausewitz? It's his constant emphasis on questioning, on analysis, on really getting to the heart of why things work the way they do in warfare. He doesn't offer easy answers or oversimplifications. Instead, he equips us with the tools to think critically about strategy, to anticipate the potential consequences of our actions, and to approach this ever-changing phenomenon of war with a healthy dose of humility, I would say. Because there are no guarantees on the battlefield, right? Exactly. He's really laying down a challenge for anyone who wants to master the art of warfare. So, to our listeners out there, especially those of you who have boots on the ground, have you encountered situations where these concepts, a strong point, an entrenched camp, a flank position, have played a decisive role? What factors contributed to their success or, conversely, their failure? It's something to think about. How do these almost timeless principles translate to the complexities of modern warfare? How do they play out in the battlefields of today? These are the questions, right? Absolutely. Well, on that note, thank you for joining us for this deep dive into the mind of Karl von Clausewitz. Yeah. It's been a fascinating journey, and we encourage you to keep exploring these ideas, keep questioning, keep learning. <laughs> Until next time. Take care.